the modern version of the birds and the bees. <laughs> Hello, I'm Francoise Bayliss. So originally, the conversation with my mother that I was going to share with you was about reproduction, and I was just going to fast forward to today, and we were going to talk about the value of egg freezing as the new Freedom 55, <laughs> which it's not. In the end, however, I decided that I'd rather share with you some of my more recent work, which is on identity and Alzheimer's. This is my mother, Gloria Bayless. Twelve years ago, she was diagnosed with vascular dementia and Alzheimer's. As the disease progressed, our conversations became very halting. There were increases in pauses and decreases in vocabulary. Today, as a consequence of the illness, my mother no longer speaks. And yet, we have a conversation once a week on a Tuesday morning, mostly when she's alert, which basically means her eyes are open, and she's talkative, which basically means she vocalizes. Our conversations are mostly monologues. I tell her about the weather, I tell her about recent family events, I tell her about my travels, I told her I was coming here, I comment on her day, I tell her it's important for her to eat well, and when she's teary, I tell her to focus on happy times. Does she understand any of it? I doubt it, but I really hope she understands the tone and the enthusiasm in my part of the conversation. So what I want to share with you right now are some recent conversations, conversations that are grounded in anger, sadness, and shame. Anger. My parents were in Barbados. My father called and said, things are not going well. You need to get us a plane ticket home. I called, I made arrangements, and then I called back with the details. I had tickets for them on a flight back to Canada in two days. My mother took the phone and started to yell at me about my incompetence and said just about the only thing that could make me furious, call your brother, he'll get it done. <laughs> no, mom, there are no other flights. I've gotten you the first flight out. It's in two days, it's first class, you're getting on that plane. Fine, I'll take a taxi. No, Mom, you will not take a taxi. What, you think I don't have enough money? No, Mom, I think there's an ocean between Barbados and Canada. <laughs> Sadness. My mother and I are sitting in a parked car, and I say to her, Mom, could you lend me your cell phone? I need to make a call. She opens her purse. She rifles through the content. She closes her purse and starts staring through the front window. M Mom, um, could, could you lend me your phone? She opens her purse again. She rifles through the contents again, and she pulls out a business card, and she hands it to me, and she says, is, is this what you're looking for? And I could see the hard work that she had done to put the words together about the cell phone and the piece of paper with the phone number, and I said, yes, Mom, that, that's what I'm looking for. Thank you. Shame. I don't remember the details of this conversation, but it's in our kitchen, and it's bright yellow, and my mom turns to me, and she says, I'm still a person. I don't know what I said to her to make her say that to me, and I sure don't remember what I said in response, but I know what I would say today. Today I would say, I know, mom, I know. This is Barbados. This is where I wish my mom could be. My mother is in an institution in Montreal. I want to share with you my current work, which is on a relational account of personal identity. And the theory that I'm advancing and defending is that my identity is not in my body. It is not a somatic or biological account that matters. But my identity is also not in my brain, what might, some people might think of as a social or psychological account of identity. My identity and everyone's identity, I argue, is in this negotiated space between us. It's about what I try to project and how I try to have you see me, and it's in fact about how you read me and what conversations you think I'm about to have or how it is that we'll go forward as you challenge me and I challenge you. So my identity is negotiated. It's constantly being negotiated between myself and others. 
On this view, identities are created in these relational contexts where I get to tell a story and you get to instantiate it or contest it, and that's all happening through conversations that happen through lived experience where we develop answers to important questions like, who are you? Where are you from? Where are you going? What do you stand for? And as we answer these pivotal questions, we instantiate our place in the world. We develop our identity. My theory of identity, because it's relational, actually means that as we develop our identity conferring stories, we do this in concert with others, others who are part of our familial, our social, our political, our religious, our cultural context. And we do this through constant actions, interactions, transactions, reactions. That's how I negotiate my identity. So given this account of personal identity, what happens as you lose your memory? as you're no longer able to participate in meaningful conversations? How do you continue to contribute to your identity constituting narrative? How do you participate in that relational exchange? How do you do that when you're slowly losing your mind? What's key to relationships? Memory, belonging, and recognition. In the early stages of deterioration, well-meaning friends used to say to me, this isn't your mother speaking or acting. It's the disease. You lost your mother some time ago. These comments were invariably offered by people who were trying to make me feel better about the situation, especially when my mom would be scowling at me, insulting me, threatening me, hitting me. They meant well, because after all, my mother was a person who loved me, cared for me, enjoyed my company, took pride in my accomplishments. Though well-intentioned, those who sought to comfort me in this way, in effect, completely negated and undermined the meaning of my sorrow. If this woman was not my mother, why was I upset? If she was just some demented stranger in the corner, why would I be grieving? There's no denying that there have been profound personality changes that my mother has experienced. There's no denying that her vocalizations and her behaviors are strange, but she is no stranger to me she is my mother. Alzheimer's robs the person of memory, but whether it also robs the person of belonging and recognition, thereby of identity, is up to us, all of us. So as my mother loses her ability to conscientiously shape her life narrative, others, myself included, must do so for her. We animate her life, and we do this in part through conversation. We hold on to what is deeply personal. We do not let it slip into the impersonal. And how do we do this? Through conversation. If you know someone with Alzheimer's, have a conversation with them. Struggle through the halting sentences, the missing words, the incoherent thoughts, or just hold their hand and tell them a story, or two, or three. Let them know that as their memory slips away, they belong, you recognize them, they are a person.